Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. Let's uh, just come to the Lord in prayer as we come to God's Word together. Lord, we give you praise and thanks for the truth of your Word and for the gift of this Word to us. Open our hearts to receive what you would say, and let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, some of you have been um, asking me during the passing of the peace about uh, Isaac, very kindly. Some of you are aware that uh, he was uh, rushed into hospital to have his appendix removed, and uh, he's a trooper. He's doing fine. He's doing well. Jenny's uh, with him this morning, so thank you uh, for asking about that. We return this morning to our uh, series in uh, Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, and we arrive at a challenging uh, passage. In fact, uh, these verses are the longest, the most detailed, and the most forceful instruction that uh, Paul offers us, in fact, which the New Testament offers us regarding church discipline anywhere. So, it's 13-odd verses, and the focus is church uh, discipline. Not the most favorite topic of pastor or parishioner in our age, but Paul deals with a particular issue uh, here um, as one of the issues that was facing the church in Corinth. So, you'll recall that in previous weeks we've noticed that one of the issues for the church in Corinth, one of the problems for the church was divisions, that there were factions in the church, that uh, there were men followers in the church, that that there was a dividing up of God's people around um, personalities. There were other sorts of divisions in the church in Corinth. Uh, Not only was there division, but there was pride and there was boasting. So there was a kind of super spiritual attitude that prevailed in the church at Corinth that despite all of these issues, they thought they were were the church that had arrived. They had various gifts. They thought they looked pretty good on the outside. And so they bragged, really, about their status as Christians. So it is remarkable, given all that bragging and boasting about their super spiritual character and nature, that Paul then should have to address an issue like this in the life of the congregation. Paul addresses this, uh, another very serious problem in that local church community or communities, the church in Corinth. Uh, we're probably not to think of a mega church in Corinth, uh, a large sort of warehouse of a North American-style building with 10,000 people at it, maybe multi-site, you know, with Paul on video in various other settings. No, probably this was multiple churches meeting in homes in the city of Corinth. It was possibly one larger one. More than likely, there were a number of churches in Corinth. And so Paul wants to, uh, needs to confront the issue of antinomianism in the church, in broad terms, antinomianism. Antinomianism literally means to be anti-law, to be anti-God's law. There was the toleration in the church of serious uh, sexual sin. Now, before we actually get into the details of what Paul has to say about this and the specific incident he's dealing with, It's an important reminder to us to recognize today, as this passage surely does, that the church, the church of Christ is a form of government. The church is a government. Paul speaks here very clearly about judgment. And look at those last two verses. He actually says, well, it's God's concern to bring into judgment those who are outside but it's your concern as the church of Christ to deal with those inside. The church is a form of government. We are accustomed to think in our age, in our modern age, in our statist age, 
to think of government solely in terms of the state. That the state is the government, that's how we talk about it, the government. But there are actually multiple forms of government. Scripture speaks of various forms of government, among which civil government, civil government is just one. In fact, Paul's teaching in the epistles generally reveals that it's not just the state, which you can read about in Romans 13, where Paul talks about the role and function of the state as a government, but also the family is a form of government. In fact, the family is the most basic form of government uh, in our lives. The church is also a government. So there are structured societal institutions that have a governmental function in our lives. And without this kind of government in the various life spheres, all you can have is anarchy. Anarchy. So the family has to be governed correctly. Paul teaches about the nature and character of the family. The church has to be governed rightly. Paul talks about that, and so does the state, and Paul talks about that. But because we're in a very uh, individualistic culture, a culture that thinks of radical autonomy as the ground of human dignity, that basically doing what you like, being who you want, uh, defining yourself, defining truth and so forth for yourself, it grates on us to think that there are institutions around us, even as Christians that we participate in, that are a form of government in our lives. And so sometimes Christians at the first sniff that they might be accountable in any sort of environment will go, they'll leave. When we do that, of course, we're not escaping God's government. Uh, in fact, our shooting around and moving about may be even a function of God's judgment uh, in our lives. We don't escape God's government by doing that. We either deal with things in our lives here and now as God's people, or God will make us deal with it at some point, or we'll face the consequences uh, later. The first form of government that you find in Scripture, the first and basic form of government, is, of course, the self-government of the Christian person. That God expects us, God calls us to govern our own lives in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're, we're, we're called upon in Scripture to govern our passions, to govern our desires, to govern our tongues, to govern our bodies, to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Nobody else can do that for you. So this is to do with our self-government. But as sinful men and women, redeemed and being sanctified and glorified, we often fail in that self-government in many ways as believers. In short, the reality of sin in us means that we need God's discipline in our lives if we are not to be fatherless, illegitimate. We cannot live the Christian life, in other words, on our own. We can't live the Christian life in isolation. There's no such thing as an isolated Christian in the sense of a Christian without belonging to a body of people. The Scriptures actually use familial metaphors, don't they, for God's discipline in our lives because one of the functions of the family and the church is, set forth, is to set forth God's loving discipline of his children. And so actually these kind of family metaphors are used in the Bible. The purpose of God's discipline, therefore, because he disciplines us as children, is not simply retributive. So the purpose of God's discipline is not simply punishment, it's restorative. The purpose of it is that we might be restored. Consider these remarkable words that will be familiar to many of you from the book of Hebrews chapter 12, which uh, the apostles there, the apostles tell us, and I quote now Hebrews 12 beginning at verse 5, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by Him. For the Lord disciplines the one He loves, 
and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them, but He disciplines us for our good so that we may share His holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. So when I was thinking about the background to what Paul is saying to the church here, this is very, very important, because this is the context of all of God's discipline in our lives. Think about the important things to notice there in Hebrews. First, the Lord disciplines those He loves. This is the covenantal love of God, just as a faithful father is going to discipline his children. It's not out of hatred, it's out of love. He disciplines not because He delights to punish, but because He loves us. Secondly, this means that chastisement is a part of true sonship. If you want to be an heir, the Scripture tells us, if you want to be an heir of God, a true son or daughter, then we need discipline without exception. Thirdly, the purpose of discipline, we're told here, is the strengthening of the body of Christ and the healing of what is lame. So again, God's purpose is that through it, the body is strengthened and that wounds are healed. Then we see, fourthly, sexual immorality is one of the sins that is singled out in Hebrews 12 that actually invites God's discipline and requires God's discipline. And then fifthly, living in unholiness or sexual immorality is the selling of our birthright and trading our sonship for illegitimacy. And finally, Hebrews makes clear that without discipline we might actually seek later for God's blessing, but neither find repentance or blessing. So that's the broader context of scriptural teaching about church discipline, and that has to be kept in mind, I think, as we come to see what Paul says here about this particular uh, instance. Where there is no discipline, degradation, disillusionment, there's a lot of D's here I've noticed now, and decline are the result. Excuse me. Consider a couple of very quick examples. Think for a moment about the collapse of the family in our culture. Think about the issue of fatherlessness. The collapse of the family has meant the collapse of discipline of faithful discipline in families. And as a result, we are seeing widespread depression. We're seeing mental health problems proliferate. There's criminality. There's delinquency. There's academic failure. And there's general hopelessness amongst young people increasingly. Almost half of children will at some point be in a home without a father. That's a lot of people. 
There are queues of students at Western universities today seeking mental health services from the university. They feel hopeless. They feel depressed. They feel isolated. They feel alone. There's a deep sense of abandonment. A lot's been said, actually, about the orphan character of our culture. The sense of being lost and alienated and abandoned. Actually, one of the, I was chatting with some friends in the church about this the other night, one of the reasons for the popularity and success of some of what Jordan Peterson has been saying in Canada and beyond, especially its effect amongst young men, is in part due to the fact, I think, that he is substituting as a father figure in popular culture. Stand up straight, put your shoulders back, make your bed, get up, face the day in a constructive fashion, etc., etc. These are basic, ordinary things about discipline. The counsel he often gives is purposeful, it's morally aware, it's generally life-affirming, and young men are very interested in it because they are lacking the discipline and guidance of a father very often. And so Christians have to everywhere step up to the plate and model what true sonship actually looks like. We shouldn't be leaving it to the world to tell society what true sonship looks like, should we? The second example is, if you look around us, you see the collapse of the mainline churches. In fact, some independent churches, movements, are collapsing, in part due to the complete neglect or abandonment of church discipline. The Anglican Church in England, for example, with which I am very familiar, has already essentially collapsed already, and is in steep decline across the country because biblical church discipline is non-existent. Neither the clergy nor the laity are disciplined for heresy or flagrant sexual immorality. So, if anything, in fact, in that church uh, movement, people in these lifestyles are being affirmed in it While Christians who want to challenge the church faithfully in terms of scriptural principles are disciplined and ostracized. Now, this is an illustration of the church becoming totally apostate, which is the essence, actually, of the meaning of Babylon in the New Testament. It's the church that is Babylon when the church fails to walk in faithfulness and obedience and holiness towards God, and exercise discipline within within its own members. Nothing invokes the judgment of God with such impunity as the apostasy of the church in failure to do this, in part because it totally undermines the witness of the gospel to an unbelieving world. In fact, without church discipline, the decline of the church and its impending judgment is absolutely assured. In fact, the church cannot actually exist, it cannot continue to exist without church discipline. Otherwise, anything goes, any belief goes, any doctrine goes, any lifestyle goes, any behavior goes. So you can see how the church cannot actually exist without church discipline. You know, I knew of, I know of a prominent former Anglican minister, so-called evangelical, in England who abandoned his wife and children for a woman less than half his age. He was very well known, popular author. Not only did he then proceed to blasphemously try and justify himself by an appeal to the adultery of King David, prominent evangelicals from other denominations proceeded to perform his wedding ceremony to his young girlfriend, of course, to which none of his children came. This man has been adopted back into the broader church fold, and his writing is being published by Christian publishers today. Now, you see, that kind of behavior marks the decline of the church, and it invokes God's judgment. 
So, the collapse of discipline in the family and the culture and its consequences, the collapse of discipline in the church and its consequences that we're seeing all around us. And then when the world looks at the church and looks and says in England, for example, looks to the Church of England for guidance in moral issues or anything else, all they see is a sea of confusion. So Paul tells us first, as we come to the text itself, that a negative report has come to his ears, a very negative report of a very serious kind. And because the church in this locality, church Christ's embassy in Corinth, is meant to manifest God's alternative to a fragmented and broken non-Christian human society, Paul is stirred up to a righteous anger here by the name of Christ and the gospel being dragged into disrepute. So, what's the specific issue? Well, there's an incestuous relationship that is not only being tolerated in the church in Corinth, it's being boasted about. The critical scriptural background, actually, to Paul's teaching here, then, is found in the Older Testament. Think of these passages. I'll just quote a few passages from Leviticus and Deuteronomy to you that is the background for what Paul is about to say. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is your father's nakedness. Leviticus 18.8. If a man lies with his father's wife, he has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. Leviticus 20.11. Cursed be anyone who lies with his father's wife, because he has uncovered his father's nakedness, and all the people shall say, Amen. Deuteronomy 27, 20. If a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die, the man who lay with the woman and the woman. You shall purge the evil from Israel. Deuteronomy 27, 20. A man shall not take his father's wife so that he does not uncover his father's nakedness. Deuteronomy 22, 30. Okay. So, in the constitution of ancient Israel, you see the seriousness of incestuous, in particular here, relationships. The seriousness of the precept is illustrated by the punishment, which was, actually, if you study Old Testament law carefully, either banishment or expulsion or even the death penalty. Now, whether the woman is a blood relative or stepmother, such a relationship or marriage is everywhere condemned in Scripture. Josephus, the ancient uh, Jewish historian, describes these incestuous relations as the grossest of sins and an outrageous crime. So, we might well ask, why might any church, any church consider this acceptable behavior. Why might a church even boast in that sort of a situation, given what Scripture says about it, given what the law of the period said about it? So, let's just try and uh, identify at least some of the details of this particular situation. The problem is almost certainly grounded in this church in Corinth in a particular attitude to sexual immorality that had its root in Greek philosophical ideas that were coming into the church with the spread of the gospel amongst the Gentiles. Corinth, for example, was a notorious city for its sexual immorality. It was the L.A. of the ancient world, or one of them. It was notorious for it. And so, Paul refers in that first verse here to a sexual immorality reported amongst them. The term he uses in the Greek there is porneia. It literally means prostitution. It's the root word from which we get our word pornography. But it means here in the general sense sexual impurity. And in particular, there's this continuing immoral relationship going on in the church that's known to the people within the church, and they're not doing anything about it. And Paul actually notes that it's of a character that's condemned even by the pagans, which is not to say that this didn't occur amongst the pagans, 
But that Roman law, we see that in the Institutes of Gaius, Roman law forbade the practice. So you have a church that is not only disobeying God's law, it's even disobeying pagan law. And there's an incomprehensible pride somehow in what's going on. How do we account for that? Well, I think Charles Hodge is helpful here. He notes the atrociousness of the case. Let me just quote Charles Hodge. A man had married his stepmother. His father's wife is a scriptural paraphrase or periphrase for stepmother. If you look at Leviticus 18.8. That it was a case of marriage is to be inferred from the uniform use of the phrase, phrase to have a woman in the New Testament, which always means to marry. Cicero speaks of such a connection as an incredible crime. Cicero. It is probable from 2 Corinthians 7, 12 that the father of the offender was still alive, end quote. So this is the situation in the church. You've got a corruption of the nature of marriage. You have an incestuous uh, relationship You have something that's condemned even by the pagans. No wonder Paul says, your boasting is not good. I mean, talk about an understatement. You have a church here boasting about its spirituality and its giftedness, and it's tolerating this kind of behavior. And that pride actually emphasizes a religious root to the problem. What was that religious root? Well, amongst the Greeks... There was a devaluing of physical life and an emphasis on spiritual liberation. This was the cultural milieu of the time, and it was mixing here, I think, in Corinth with Christian doctrine. There was a blending of the ideas of Greek philosophy, so just bear with me for a second. Plato believed that the body was a tomb for the soul. The tomb. And salvation was, in the end, about liberation from the body. The material world was a lesser place created by a demiurge. And so, with elements of Greek philosophy and the nature religions, the mystery cults that were around that Paul we see elsewhere combating in the time of the early church, there was this thought that one could transcend the negative realm, the material realm, the physical realm, and have a higher knowledge of immaterial reality, the spiritual realm, a realm of ideas, and one could have maybe union even with that reality, and you achieve that in paganism through uh, union with temple prostitutes, cultic prostitution. So what was done, many of them thought, in the body was basically irrelevant. Because the material world, the physical realm, was less important, less relevant. It was lesser. What really mattered was your spirit, your spiritual liberty, your spiritual liberation, the realm of ideas. Well, given Paul's teaching, when you think about it, about life in the spirit, freedom in Christ, you can see how it would be not too difficult for unstable, untaught people bringing the cultural thought of the time into the life of the church, perverting that teaching into a kind of libertinism, a kind of sexual libertinism. In fact, some of them might even have seen it as a form of spiritual attainment or progress to indulge those appetites whilst being pure, as it were, in spirit, showing your detachment from the body. Well, that's likely the case, but whatever the reason, the response to it, Paul says, should have been grief. It should have been mourning, and instead there was pride. Now, since laws against incest are drawn directly from the law of Moses, to quote Hodge again, he points out, let me just uh, note what he says here again, we have here, he says, therefore, a clear recognition of the perpetual obligation of the Levitical law concerning marriage. To deny, therefore, the permanency of the law recorded in Leviticus 18 is not only to go contrary to the authority of the apostle, apostle, but also to teach that there is no such crime as incest for Christians. 
So historically, evangelicals have recognized that Paul here is affirming the totality of God's law. And to, to, to reject what Paul is saying is not only to reject apostolic authority, it's to reject all scriptural authority and basically say, well, we're free to practice these things. So that was the report that had come to Paul. How does he deal with it? Well, Paul brings a steadfast response. And it's not easy. I mean, that, it's not easy to, 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 to bring a steadfast response as a church leader to sin in the life of the church. It's easier to turn a blind eye. It's easier to look the other way. It's easier to have the quiet life in the short term for church leaders than to address and confront sin in the life of the church. But Paul wants to be faithful to Christ. And the matter is very relevant for the church today despite the extreme nature of this case, because in the last couple of decades in the West, in a manner never, be, never seen before in the whole history of the church, in the last two decades, every form of sexual immorality and distortion is being endorsed and supported in the culture and is being brought into the church. And in some cases, the response of the church is pride, no pun intended. In some cases, the response is literally pride. When the rainbow flag of the LGBTQ, 22, SA, etc., 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 revolutionary movement is draped over the altar, the communion table of the church, as has been done here in Toronto, you are seeing radical judgment on the church and an invoking of that judgment on the church. When sexually immoral people are claiming to be Christians and marry other men or women, when professing Christians claim to develop a queer theology for the church, when parenthood is scrambled in European law with the legislation of incest, as is now the case, by the way, in much of Europe. There's the removal of, mar of, of laws against marrying your stepmother. What is to be said in those kind of situations? When adultery and fornication of every kind proliferate in the church, what is the church supposed to do? That's a question for the church today, a big question. And what has much of the church been doing? What has much of it been doing? Caving in. Submitting to. Syncretizing with the culture. Well, that's not Paul's approach. First, Paul says, mourning, grief, should be the first response of the church to these kinds of things. Grief, mourning, any sort of pride or taking lightly sexual immorality is blasphemous. Paul wants the church to mourn over this as though it were their own sin as a community, to take corporate responsibility in the life of the church. It needed to be acknowledged, it needed to be confessed. And you see this kind of a pattern throughout Scripture. Think about Ezra, the prophet scholar in the Older Testament, as he mourned over the sins of the community first of all, and then commanded that the sexually immoral separate themselves from their foreign pagan relationships or be expelled from the community. So mourning, grief, is the first requirement. Secondly, Paul is clear then that expulsion or excommunication is required, and he has already determined this is God's required judgment. Look at verse 3, though I'm absent in body, I'm present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. Can you imagine if the church in the West had led in the way that Paul leads here? If it had been clear on the issues of human sexuality? Can you imagine the example that would be right now to the world, to the culture, to the community? 
Offenders in Israel in the Older Testament were expelled because the Israelites were to be a sanctified covenant community. And Paul actually then takes up an analogy by making us think of Israel, making us think of the Hebrews, of the Passover. Look at verses 6 through 8. We're told to get rid of the old leaven, the old yeast. And the citation from Deuteronomy 17, 7, purge or expel the wicked person from among you, makes clear that excommunication is required for unrepentant offenders. Now, I grant that that doesn't seem like too big a threat these days, does it? Well, I'll be suspended from the Lord's table, and if I'm not repentant, I'll be put out of the church. Why does it not seem like too big a threat today? Well, because we don't take seriously enough the government of the church. And then we think, well, there's 15 other churches that will receive me down the road. And they won't be interested in why I was expelled from another church. They may not even know I was expelled from another church. So, because of our individualism, because of the consumerism of the culture, I grant that we don't feel the weight as we should of this. But we should feel it. We should feel the weight of it. This excommunication was to take place when the people were assembled in the name and power of the Lord Jesus. This is church government functioning as it should in the presence of the congregation, because this is how in biblical law the community was involved in judgment. So the question arises, though, in this, this instant, what did Paul mean when he said that the man was to be delivered over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh or sinful nature? What does that mean? It's a difficult expression, isn't it? Well, we're told that the purpose of the handing over is the destruction of the sinful nature, the flesh, and ultimately the salvation of man, of the person involved, the man or the woman, depending on the case. Now, some people have wondered whether Paul is here calling down a particular kind of curse upon this individual so that he might become ill, so that he might die, or something of that nature. And it is true that when you look at the New Testament itself, you see that under apostolic authority, take for example the case of Ananias and Sapphira, there were serious consequences for sin that would be judged a lesser offense than this one. However, I don't think it's likely the case that what Paul is trying to say here for, in terms of destruction of the flesh, and I'll comment a little bit more on why in a moment, that he's actually talking about calling down a unique and particular curse on this particular individual. The first is that this was a kind of normative situation of church discipline. Paul was laying out for the church a pattern for the churches to follow in the future. Now, David and I can't uh, put down as a pattern for ourselves what Peter did in the case of Ananias and Sapphira. You know, if you say, well, I've been tithing this year, and you actually really haven't been, it's not going to be the case that the, that you're going to fall down dead and likely be carried out by the deacons, okay? There was a very unique situation there in the life of the apostles where God was making a peculiar and particular miraculous point. Paul here, though, is laying down a pattern of church discipline. He's laying down a normative structure of church discipline for others to follow. And remember, there's actually a similar formulation that occurs in 1 Timothy 1.20, where Paul delivers over um, Hymenaeus and Alexander to Satan for a disciplinary purpose that they learn not to blaspheme. So there was a, an edu there was a learning restorative process there that was the intention. So you have a similar formula, and the process is meant to be a restorative. Second of all, Paul is using throughout, and he actually uses it throughout both his letters to the church in Corinth, a temple imagery. Temple imagery. The second temple Judaism um, that was known to, well known to the Jews of the time, they used excommunication when they were applying the Levitical laws 
uh, that we find in Leviticus and Deuteronomy when they were applying it to their communities. So, a man must suffer destruction because he's destroyed the holy temple, which is the church, which means he must be separated from the community of faith. So, it seems uh, rather than imagining that Paul has a peculiar, individual, particular judgment on this man's flesh in the narrow sense, to recognize here what's um, being said in the broader context of the New Testament, that Scripture tells us that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He's the prince of this world. He's the prince of this world. He's, that is, he's the prince of the pattern of this world, and he rules over the kingdom of darkness. Now, when you look at Paul's ministry in the way in which he describes salvation, conversion, he talks about it as being one of translation from the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan, to the kingdom of light, to the kingdom of God. There is a transference that takes place from one kingdom into the other. And so, excommunication, to be expelled, expelled from the community, meant to be transferred out of the kingdom of God's Son back into the dominion of Satan, back into the domain of Satan, which is why we're then told that such a person is to be treated as a non-believer, essentially, because there is a transference by their actions. The church is to pronounce that they don't recognize such a one if in unrepentance as a Christian. They belong to a different domain. So that was what the expulsion meant here by a handing over to Satan. And this is supported by the fact that the way Paul uses the words flesh and spirit. When Paul talks about the flesh and the spirit, we mustn't think, as we are accustomed to because of the influence of the nature of Western thought, to think of this Greek way of thinking, that the flesh is this lower part that can be destroyed, but the man's spirit then will be saved. As though by getting rid of his body, somehow he's going to be liberated and saved. That is not what Paul is saying. Paul utterly rejects any kind of dichotomy between the physical and the spiritual of the sort we see in Greek philosophy. He doesn't accept that. For Paul to be in the flesh or to be in the Spirit is to contrast two different directions of your life, two different orientations of one's life. The flesh represents for Paul the totality of a person, including their spirit, in opposition to God. That's what it means to be in the flesh, to be carnally minded, to have the mindset of the world. To be in the Spirit designates the total being, including our physical being, but redeemed and in relationship with Christ. That's what it means to be in the Spirit. So, the translation actually uh, for the destruction of the sinful nature, which is the uh, NIV, actually properly conveys Paul's religious directional use of the word flesh. The aim of excommunication, then, is the destruction of of the offender's way of life. That's its purpose. The purpose is the destruction of that person's way of life, that by being excluded from the life of the body, the person might come to their senses like a prodigal, that they might be brought to repentance, that they might see that they're on a path that leads to death and destruction and that they need to turn around. And failure to exercise that kind of discipline, Paul warns, affects the entire church. Look at verse 6. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Which is to say, sin has a way of diffusing itself when left unchecked. It has a corrupting influence when it's left unaddressed. It sears people's consciences. It alienates people from God. It invites God's judgment, which does actually include, as we know from Paul's teaching about the table of the Lord, sickness and death. It strengthens sin and evil. It leaves it unexposed. So, but Paul always has a way of turning these things into a positive exhortation to God's people. 
And I love the way that he does this, even with this very, very difficult situation that's a huge grief to him that he says should have produced mourning in the church. Paul is able to help people to see the significance of expulsion of the offender. Taking this picture of Passover, he paints this familiar picture of the Passover night. It's the exodus from Egypt, you'll recall. The exodus from Egypt meant salvation, deliverance from death, from the angel of death. It meant deliverance from slavery. It meant being brought out as God's covenant people. He reminds them that by expelling the offender, they're cleansing out the old leaven. So, in that first section, what Paul has essentially done is he's cleansed the temple. <laughs> he's cleansing the temple. And now he calls the church, having cleansed the temple, he says, now celebrate the festival of Passover. Now, he does not mean return to the Jewish festival of the Passover, because he says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. What he's saying in this figure, in this metaphor, is that we now need to, having cleansed the temple, celebrate the feast, celebrate our salvation, just as Hezekiah, after removing defilement from the temple, reestablished temple service, and he calls on the people to celebrate Passover. Josiah does the same thing. Having cleansed the temple, they're called to celebrate Passover. Paul says to the church, celebrate the festival. How do we celebrate the festival? He says we do so with a new lump, not with the old leaven of malice and of evil. Now, in case you didn't know this, uh, because most of us probably don't bake our own bread these days, leaven actually was a small portion of the previous week's batch of dough that you've left to ferment. So you leave a bit of the previous batch, you let it ferment, and then you add that fermented dough to the bread that you're making, and it causes the bread to rise. But with that process, there's always a slight risk of infection, of contamination, especially if the process goes on without the creation of a new batch where you use unleavened bread. So every year, the Hebrews, you'll remember, had to cleanse their homes and cleanse the temple of all leaven. Part of the reason would have been simply for people's good health. So the unleavened bread from the Feast of Unleavened Bread provides the fresh leaven so that you could start another 12-month cycle with a fresh batch. That was the idea. So you expel the old so that you start fresh, and contamination, infection is avoided. And when they left Egypt for the Passover, you'll remember, they didn't have time to leaven the bread, so the Feast of Unleavened Bread commemorates that occurrence. God's faithfulness to them. So there's a figurative meaning here that I think is obvious, or it should be obvious to us, that a small amount of leaven, a small amount, can seep into the whole church community if left unchecked. And unchecked, it can destroy the church. That's how serious it is. It can destroy the church. And so Paul broadens out this narrow point of church discipline. He keeps it in mind, but he broadens it out. He says, given all that Christ has done for us, given our salvation, given that Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us, and we've been freed from death and saved slavery, let's celebrate our life in Christ together. The Christian life is one long celebration. It's a festival. It's a feast. Let's celebrate our life together by keeping the feast with holy living, with moral purity. That's what Paul is saying. But he wants to clarify. He wants to clarify what he's not saying. Now, he says, you know, as in my letter I've written to you, in all probability, he's not referring to the earlier part of the letter. He's now referring to a letter, because this is 1 Corinthians after all. He's referring to a letter that we no longer have. We don't have to worry about that. If God had thought we'd needed another letter of Paul to Corinth, we would have it. We don't have that letter. But he said, I, I wrote to you in this other letter, and some people have misunderstood what he said in that other letter. Perhaps that's the reason it's not in the canon. Perhaps he wasn't clear enough. Right? But in this letter he is, 
And so he says, uh, to, to clarify with them, he says, I'm not talking about you disassociating yourself from immoral members of society, from sexually immoral members of society. Look at verse 9 and 10. I wrote to you in my letter. That's the letter we don't have. Not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world, obviously. Paul is not saying that we, sh we can't have social interaction and fellowship with immoral and wicked people. That's an unavoidable fact of life. Unless you want to exit the planet, unless you want to leave this world, these are the people that you are living next to, that you are working with, that you're inviting over for a barbecue during the summer. These are the people that are all around us who need to know Christ, who need to celebrate the Passover with us. How can one even share the gospel if we don't interact and share life with such people? There are many people who defraud for the sake of gain. There are those who exact what is not justly theirs. Idolatry is a fact of life all around us. We can't leave the world. This is God's world. We're not even called to leave it. We're called to see God's renewing grace and power at work within it. So Paul's exhortation, he clarifies, is for believers in the church not to associate in Christian fellowship with those who claim to be brothers in Christ or sisters in Christ, but who persist in an unrepentant lifestyle of sin. Those are the ones to whom, with whom we are not to associate as though they were Christians. Paul is really continuing here the image of the temple. In Psalm 101.7 we read, no one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. So that's a psalm speaking about the expulsion of the wicked Israelite from the city of the Lord. So the application is that the one who in unrepentant rebellion does not act consistently with his profession as a believer is not to be recognized as a believer is not to be treated as a believer, is not to be associated with as though they were brothers in the Lord. We must do nothing as a church community that would sanction the idea that the offenses referred to by Paul are tolerated by the gospel. Remember, the gospel is something Paul says that we obey. And he lists five vices, the greedy, idolater, reviler, drunkard, swindler. We don't have time, don't worry, to expound on the meaning of all of those terms. I haven't got another five points to deal with. But he does talk about uh, these as illustrative, and they have a remarkable parallel, actually, to offenses dealt with in Deuteronomy that are a cause for expulsion from amongst the Israelites. The purpose is not only the discipline of the individual, but it's the godly fear of of the congregation. So Paul's injunction in verse 13, look at it, purge the evil person from among you. Now that causes all of God's people, it should cause God's church, to fear the Lord together, to honor the Lord together, to reverence God together as a community. Respecting Therefore, the necessity of church discipline is a corporate responsibility of the church community, and without it, the church essentially ceases to exist. We're told, actually, Paul says, not even to eat with such a one. Now, that doesn't have reference to the Lord's table. Uh, it's obvious from the nature of excommunication that such a person is not permitted to participate in the Lord's table. Such a person is, does, is not permitted to come to the table. What Paul is saying is that to have table fellowship with such a person as though they were a genuine follower of Christ is not, is not permitted because it would indirectly endorse their sin. Is that a ban on all forms of social interaction with an excommunicated person? 
I don't think so. I don't think it's a ban on all interaction with such a person because how else could they be appealed to? How else could they approach the body in repentance? How else could they bring their confession? How else could we seek individually to reason with such a person in terms of the gospel? But Paul's concern is that they should not be associated with as though they were brothers in Christ. And so Paul wraps it all up by wanting to say that he's not interested, therefore, in judging people outside the church. And it's a hypocritical church context that would be spend all its time judging the outside without ever paying attention to the inside. Paul's essentially saying, I'm not a Roman magistrate. It's God's business to judge those outside. And Paul makes clear in Romans 13 the nature, the function of the magistrate in the life of those outside, that actually it is meant to punish the wrong and reward the right, that it doesn't bear the sword in vain. But Paul says, that's not my responsibility. That's God's business. He says, our concern, not only his concern, but he says, your concern should be judging those inside the church of Christ. Not judgmentalism, not pointing the finger, but taking corporate responsibility when issues of overt, unconfessed sin arise in the life of the church. We must prophetically preach the righteousness and mercy of God to an unbelieving world, of course, and set forth the righteousness of God in the way that we live as a community of believers. Cleanse out the old leaven. And so, no instruction of Paul really is more forceful in speaking about righteousness, the seriousness of sin, and the holiness of God's people before the Lord in this teaching about church discipline, that we are required to expel the unrepentant, wicked person in the hope of regaining them to protect the church's standing before God and the world. That's how we're light in the darkness. That's part of how we witness to the truth of the light. Now, it would not be right to close the sermon without just saying in one minute something very significant, the glad result of Paul's action here in the life of the Corinthian church. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians, his second letter, chapter 7. After the church has read this letter, after he's become aware of their response to his challenge to them. He says this, as it is, I rejoice, 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 13, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what your earnestness, this godly grief, has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God, therefore we are comforted. In other words, it seems that the response of the church in Corinth to this discipline was exemplary. Despite their sins and their faults as a church, they went on to prove themselves innocent in the matter by their godly grief, by their repentance, and by their righteous action. Now, we're not explicitly told if the man himself here came to repentance and was restored to the congregation. Certainly, Paul's words of praise leave open the possibility that he was. We're not told. Perhaps he was amongst the godly grieving ones. But the end of all of this for Paul and the church was the comfort of Christ. That's what discipline produces in the end, comfort. 
The right and privilege of church discipline, brothers and sisters, is for our comfort, comfort, our joy, and our salvation, and it produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness. It's the great blessing to be under the Lord's discipline and to be treated as sons and daughters, and it's in this way that we actually celebrate a a perpetual festival of our redemption with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so, as we come to the Lord's table this morning, we can do so, can't we, with a due sense of reverence for the Lord, honor for the Lord, and rejoicing in God for the privilege of our sonship.